Welcome. In this lecture on rights and Indian constitution in the NCRT, we will be focusing predominantly on fundamental rights, fundamental duties and DPSPs, the directive principles of state policies. We will understand what are they, what are the differences and why they are really important. But before we begin, let us understand what is constitution as we discussed before. It is a living document that actually gives or sets the limits of powers that the government has and ensures that in a democratic setup, everyone gets equal rights. Now, these rights are the fundamental basis. Now, what happened in 1982 during the Asian Games, there were a lot of labor which was involved in the construction activity, but they were not paid at par to what was the, the, the rate, the prevailing rate at that time. And this was a case of right uh, the fundamental right against exploitation. So the court accepted the plea that was laid down and government ensured that the thousands of workers who are involved for the work should get the right wages they should they are prescribed for. Now in this whole case there was a match, um, uh, Machal Laloon, uh, a boy from Assam he was a 23 year old boy but was found a mentally challenged person and he went to uh, the the Lok, Lokpriya Gopinath Bardoli mental hospital got treated and later on went for the judicial custody. Now after uh, all of his life was spent this concept was brought that uh, there is the violation of rights that was done. And that was not part of the constitutional rights. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a fundamental right or uh, act against the exploitation which was done. So uh, there has to be a right against exploitation that has to be preserved for even the weakest section of the society. And this is really what we need to take into account. Now, what is the Bill of Rights? The list of rights which are mentioned and protected by the constitution is what is known as the Bill of Rights. Now this list of rights is prohibiting the government from acting against the individuals or the values or the rights for individual and in case there is any violation it has to keep an eye or keep a check. Individuals would need the protection from the government and the same has to be seeked later on. Also, uh, we, if we take the case of let's say South Africa, in 1996, the constitution of South Africa was inaugurated. And when the constitution of South Africa was inaugurated, it laid down the Bill of Rights as the cornerstone of democracy and it said that actual uh, actually any kind of discrimination would be forbidden and this has to be on the grounds of race, gender, marital status, ethnicity, religion, language, uh, belief, culture and so on. So some of the rights that was laid down in the South African constitution was right to dignity, right to privacy, right to fair labor practices, healthy environment and right to protection of environment, right to adequate housing and health care, children right, right to higher education, cultural rights and right to information. So these are the rights which have been laid down under the constitution of India, uh, sorry in the constitution of South Africa. Moving from South Africa to the constitution of India, we have the following six fundamental rights. These fundamental rights as they are called as FRs are the right to equality, freedom, right against exploitation, right to freedom to practice any religion, cultural and educational rights and right to constitutional remedies which is also called as the heart and soul of the constitution. Now, let's first understand what is the difference between an ordinary right and a fundamental right. Fundamental as the name suggests is fundamental that means it is very basic to the, the provisions of the constitution and therefore is important. So fundamental right main importance is that that constitu uh, the constitution itself ensures that they are not violating uh, or they are not being violated by the government so this fundamental right actually ensures that they are not violated by the 
government so constitution does ensure that they are not violated by the government now when we talk about ordinary rights they are protected and enforced by ordinary laws so protected and enforced by ordinary law in contrast to the ordinary right what is fundamental right fundamental rights are protected and guaranteed by the constitution of india so the fundamental rights are given and protected under the constitution of india however ordinary rights are protected under the ordinary laws that's the foremost thing now ordinary laws or ordinary rights can be changed by normal legislation which can be brought in the legislature and this is what is called as the ordinary process of making law so by an ordinary process of making law ordinary rights can be actually brought into force however if i want to bring the change into the fundamental right what is required a uh, amendment is required clear so that's again a very paramount important concept so motilal nehru back in 1928 demanded for bills of right and soon after the constitution was laid down it was the release of the fundamental rights that was brought and government can put reasonable restrictions on exercising these fundamental rights so these fundamental rights these six fundamental rights are really important and we'll be understanding these one by one so the very first one here is the right to equality right to equality that means we have two person here and both of them want a cup of tea a cup of tea if i give one in a earthen cup and another in a steel cup that's a discrimination this could be based on gender class creed or any other aspect but that is what is termed as discrimination so it violates the right to equality let's say i have an open position for job but i allow only males above a certain age group to apply for that job i do not allow females to apply for that job then this is again a violation of the right to equality so right to equality says that we are equal before law everyone is protected equally there can be no discrimination on any grounds caste can uh, caste creed gender religion or language ethnicity there should be equal access to all people for all things it includes education health shops markets any basic amenity should be accessible to everyone you cannot say that so and so people would not be allowed in this segment no that's a violation of the right to equality also no titles can be given except this exception is important except for military or academics only in military and academics titles are allowed besides that no titles are allowed any kind of untouchability the concept of existence of dalits is not allowed so abolition of untouchability and equal opportunity for employment in each field is allowed so those are part of the right to equality coming on next is the basic idea to understand so right to equality uh, we have understood the basics but one major thing two important articles article 164 talks about that nothing in the state shall prohibit uh, the reservation for the appointments to backward classes that means you are making sure that even the weaker sections of the society are given equal opportunity and under, under article 21 there is the protection for life and liberty so protection for life and liberty under article 21 is uh, again important that means no one shall be deprived of the life and personal liberty except according to the procedures established under law so that's the basic idea that we need to understand so when we talk about certain sections of the society what we highlight 
women, weaker section, minorities, uh, socially backward, educationally backward, financially backward. So those are all equally protected under the law. Clear? And no discrimination could be made on that basis. The next is right against exploitation. In the very beginning itself, we talk about we talked about a case where we focused on the right against exploitation. The idea is any kind of forced labor, begar practice should be prohibited, and children below 14 years cannot be employed uh, in dangerous jobs, for example, factories, mining, any kind of hazardous activity. They cannot be involved with. That's the right against exploitation the next is right to freedom of religion now right to freedom of religion incorporates two things first is equality of all religions in the constitution all religions are at par you cannot say one religion presides over the other so all religions stand equal and the second important thing is the right to uh, practice any religion that you want that means freedom of faith and freedom of worship so i am free to choose my own religion i am free to worship the religion i want government can impose restrictions on certain specific practices for example it could be related to uh, human sacrifice, it could be related to sati, it could be related to bigamy, but only on that cases ban can be imposed. But otherwise, in the court of law, all stand equal, all religions are from the same faith and government must extend equal treatment to all religion. The religious affairs are free to manage and the religious instructions in certain institutions are free to be given by that institution. So those are the key things that we focus under right to freedom of religion. Moving on next is the right to liberty and personal freedom. Now what is liberty? Liberty means doing the thing I doing the things I want in the way I want but within the limits. That means within the prescribed limits, I have to maintain that limits, those limits of law and order. But within that, I have my own choice to do the things in my own way. So I have a freedom of thought. I have a freedom of expression and action as well. So the first, as I said, is freedom, the right to speech and expression to assemble peacefully and form association. I have a freedom to move across the territory of India. No one can bar me from going from one region to another region or stop me from moving freely in certain parts of the territory. I have the right to establish myself and settle myself in any part with any of the occupation that I want to carry or any of the trade and business I want to do right to life and liberty and right of the accused and the convicts. Now these two are extremely important. Right to life and liberty means no one can be arrested without the grounds for which the arrest is made. In case the arrest is done within 24 hours, the police has to take the case to the magistrate and the magistrate would decide whether the case is justified or is not justified. Supreme Court has also said that right to live with human dignity and free of exploitation is again a right to liberty and personal freedom. So that's one of the important rights. The second important right is the right to prevent preventive detention. That means only if the person has committed a crime or an offense, then the person can be arrested. Uh, sometimes the person can be arrested based on the apprehension that this crime has been done or the person has been engaged in unlawful activity. But the government has a, a certain broad window in which uh, this case has to be resolved and the maximum time duration is three months for the advisory body to review the case. The next is freedom to assemble and form associations which we have already discussed. So it's you can live in any part of the region, form groups, form um, uh, uh, assemblies and 
create protest or policy issues or bring in um, issues of concern that you are uh, looking for. And the last one, the really important one is the right of the accused and the convicts. Now here, the constitution makes sure that uh, the person who is accused, even the right of that person gets protected. So the person who is charged with some offense or guilt, uh, unless it has been proven, uh, it is not necessary that um, it, it's not the case that the opportunities would be deferred to the person. So constitution has provided three fundamental things here. One is no person can be punished for the same offense more than once. The second important thing is no person sa shall ask for advice against oneself. The third important thing is no, no law shall declare any action illegal from a back date that was issued, right? The next is cultural and educational rights. Now the idea here is minority groups, Jains, Buddhists, Muslims, Parsis, all of them have the right to protect their language, protect their culture and create and establish their own educational institutions where they can depart knowledge and their, uh, their, uh, their culture could be preserved, right? So that's what is the cultural and the educational rights of the minority. And that's where in certain segments of the society, they might be a majority, but in the whole population of India, they appear to be a minority, right? The next one is the right to constitutional remedy. The right to constitutional remedy simply implies that you have the right to move to the court for any writ that you want. We have covered all these five writs in detail in a separate lecture. So if you want, do refer that lecture for more comprehensive coverage. Here, to just summarize quickly, this right to constitutional remedy is considered as the heart and soul of the constitution because it's the right of an every individual to approach the high court or the supreme court and get the case resolved in case of violation if any. Now, habeas corpus, mandamus, prohibition, q warranto and certiorari are the five major ones. Certiorari is where the lower court transfers the case to a higher court. So from a lower court, the case goes simply to a higher court or a higher authority. Q warranto is issued if the court finds that the person is holding an office but is not entitled to hold the office. So check whether the person is entitled to hold the office or not. Prohibition says that a writ which is issued by a high court when uh, the uh, when a lower court has considered that this is a case which cannot be resolved in their territory. Right? So lower court acknowledges that this is a case that we cannot resolve and then only high court actually takes this into account. So it's a writ which is issued by the high court when the lower court considers that the case is not within the jurisdiction of the local court or the lower court. The next is mandamus. Mandamus is issued when a particular officer is not doing a legal duty and therefore is infringing the rights of an individual. So not abiding by the legal duty by a public officer. The next is hebis corpus. Hebis corpus means the court orders that the arrest of the person should be, uh, uh, should be presented before it and this is the basic important aspect of the idea under hebis corpus. So all of these five writs are actually considered as the heart and soul and they are because that's the only way for the citizens to ensure that their rights are preserved and they are not violated. In case of when we talk about human rights so much, uh, the poor, the illiterate, the deprived section actually are not able to exercise their rights. So to protect their rights, we do have certain commissions. One such commission is Human Rights Commissions. In India, it is called as the NHRC, the National Human Rights Commission. Now, similar to this, we also have National Commission for Scheduled Castes, Scheduled Tribes, 
uh, for women and so on. Now this commission is actually a watchdog which looks against the violations of the rights which are done. Also this was established in 2000 and has uh, a, um, the composition is actually the chief justice of the supreme court. You have former judges and chief justice of, uh, of a high court and then there are members who are um, eminent faculties in their own expert domains. The main idea is to see that the weaker section is not deprived of their human rights. In case they are deprived, uh, their complaints or violations are being taken into account and any researchers in this field of human rights and protection of human rights can be smoothly taken by the government and the future recommendations based on it can be done. The next is directive principles of the state policy. Now as the name suggests, these are the directions, the policy initiatives which are given by the state. So at the same time, the constitution did not want that the government should take into policy decisions. But yes, the government would give in certain directives as to what should be implemented, how it should be implemented and how the society can actually adopt it, what are the rights of individuals and how they enjoy it besides the fundamental rights or the basic rights which are existing and the policies which the government should actually bring and adopt for. So all these are laid down under the directive principles of state policy. Now for example, uh, if I talk about Zamitari abolition bill, nationalization of banks, factory acts, minimum wages, um, rules for small and cottage industries, all of those are set under the directives of the state policy and these are uh, actually also focusing on the tier 2, tier 3 cities, uh, the system of Panchayati Raj and schemes for welfare. For example, midday meals scheme is one such a scheme. Now, under the directive principles of state policy, most of the principles are classified under socialist, Gandhian and liberal principles. We have the various articles which are covered under each of these principles. We won't dive into the details of each of the articles here because that's not part of your NCRT syllabus. But the idea here is to have a basic understanding between the differences of the fundamental rights and directive principles of the state policy. So fundamental right aims to protect the rights of an individual. So protect right of an individual but DPSPs aim at bringing in welfare or well-being of an individual. The next is fundamental rights restrain the government from doing certain things because they say that these are the fundamental rights that an individual have but DPSPs actually exhort the government to do certain things. So that's again a major difference. Now. In the list of rights, we did have a right to property in 1950. The government made this law as limited it to right to property. Now this was in the center a long debated issue. Finally in 73, the Supreme Court decision was laid down and this was not a part of the basic structure of the constitution. The parliament brought in an amendment and this right to property was constitutionally removed in 1978 under the 44th constitutional amendment and this was considered from a fundamental right to a legal right. Again an important aspect that you must know. Now coming on to another important aspect of it is fundamental duties, the duties of the citizen. In 1976, 42nd amendment was brought and this brought in the list of fundamental duties under part 4a of the constitution constitution and enforcing these duties to the citizen of the country. Now when the constitution defers it, the enjoyment of the rights dependent or conditional are based on the fulfillment of the duties. For example, abiding to or uh, respecting the national anthem, the national flag, following the ideals, uh, the ideas from the freedom structure, uh, 
protecting the integrity defending the country and the national services having an idea of brotherhood moving for excellence opportunity for education for age group 6 to 14 is a fundamental duty bringing in safety for public property developing a scientific temper protecting the environment and calling for a composite culture and preserving that culture so those are some of the important aspects that we have covered under fundamental duties now one very important thing is under this whole ncert coverage the articles the name of the articles and the content under each article was missing only few articles were mentioned for example article 16 4 article 21 those articles which have been mentioned we have discussed those here but if uh, the articles in itself lying under the fundamental rights are uh, extremely important the rights and the fundamental uh, the dpsps are extremely important so uh, all those are covered extensively in the complete video lecture course the link given below follow that for more details have a wonderful day ahead thanks for joining